Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement, or rather, Adrian's Commodore Basement. That's right, we're going to get back into some Commodore videos. I recently watched Jan Bita's video where he fixed several Commodore 16s that he had sort of stockpiled, and I like the idea of that. Today we're going to copy that theme, except it's going to be Commodore 64s. We're going to have a little bit of a repair-a-thon and see how many I can get working. I've stockpiled four Commodore 64s, and I have no idea if any of them work at all. Let's dig right into them. Actually, before we get started, let's talk about what I'm going to be using to help troubleshoot these machines. Of course, first off is a multimeter. I'm going to be using my EEV Blog 121GW. Next is a chip puller. A friend of mine showed me his, and it was so cool that I had to order my own, and you're going to feel the same way once you see how well this thing works. Then we have a logic probe. I recently got this and started using it for troubleshooting, and I got to say, I love this thing. Next up is the indispensable dead test and diagnostic cartridge. I bought this little PCB off eBay, and you just have some dip switches here to configure which ROM you're going to be using, but if you're going to be troubleshooting Commodore 64s, the dead test is especially useful. I use these little magnetic trays for holding screws. You can get these at Harbor Freight. They are designed for working on cars, but they're especially useful for computers because you can just throw screws in there and they don't fly away accidentally. Inside this spray bottle is 99% isopropyl alcohol, useful for cleaning up boards if there's a little bit of corrosion or gunk on there. And this is my Commodore 64 Ziff machine. When I got this machine, it was broken, so I repaired it, which I can't remember exactly what was wrong with this. But in the process, I ended up socketing all the main chips. Like, see, these are in sockets. But I also installed Ziff sockets for the VIC, the PLA, the CPU, one RAM chip, and one of the CIA chips. Oh, and the VIC-2 as well. That allows me to very easily pop these chips out, and if I have another machine that I want to see if those chips are good, I can pop them in this thing very quickly and very easily to see if they're working. You can find these ZIF sockets on eBay, and they're very inexpensive. They're clearly 3M knockoffs, but they work good enough on here, and for the cheap price and, you know, for this test machine, I don't care. And then before you troubleshoot any new unknown condition Commodore 64, I really recommend that you hook up a known good working machine to a power supply and a video cable first, just to make sure that you know that those cables are good. You don't want to go and find that your Commodore 64 has a black screen and you think there's a fault with the machine when in reality, it's say your video cable that's not working. And for outputting the Commodore 64 to an HDMI monitor like this, I'm using the RetroTank 2X which converts S-Video or Composite or Component Video into HDMI. I especially love the RetroTink because it basically has almost no latency. And I'll just talk about my power supply that I'm using. I am using a homemade power supply. So this is case I 3D printed. It has an IEC input with a power switch. And inside here I have a 5 volt 4 amp switching power supply and I have a 1 amp transformer for the 9 volts AC. I did peel this power supply sticker off one of the original Commodore 64 power supplies. The current ratings on here aren't accurate, but I thought it just looks neat how that is. All right, now let's get to actually fixing these machines. All right, the first unit is on the bench and it's filthy. And what I like to do is use a little bit of painter's tape to label the machines. That way I won't mix them up. So I'm gonna label them one through four. We'll just put a little sticker right here. And that way I can also write whatever faults I find with the machine on here. So this is number one, and there we go. Taking a look at this 64, at least it has all the keys intact. None of the keys seem broken. Things are very dirty, of course, but not too bad. On the bottom, it still has the original RF shield, has no feet, don't see anything broken, and it actually has all three screws. That's kind of nice. Let's get this open. I can definitely see someone has been in this machine before because the motherboard screws, someone used screws that were too long and they actually started poking through the bottom of the machine. So this machine is not virgin. It has definitely been opened before. All right, an early revision board here. We have gold RAM chips from Mostec, the large can, and these capacitors, which are normally sort of here, like on my other Ziff machine right here. See them there? They're moved around because the can is so big. And it's actually an early five pin one, so I'm gonna have to find my VIC-20 cable to even plug this into the retro tank. So date codes on these chips seem to indicate that this machine was probably made around the end of 1982, so it's definitely early. 
Now from a screw on the motherboard perspective, there's literally, is there none? Uh, yeah, there's nothing holding it in. It was just loose. I didn't take those screws out. So <laughs> someone clearly has been in here. Uh, but actually interesting is the standoffs aren't broken. So that's nice. Oh, that one's a little, a little cruddy looking. And yes, it does have the RF shield on the bottom, but it looks like it's already been desoldered. So thank you whoever did that. So I don't even have to bother. I can just pop it right off. But that would indicate that this has had some kind of repair. Yep. So it looks like someone had actually didn't desolder all of it or they soldered it back on. I don't know. Uh, some people like to desolder these shields. I don't. I just cut them off. Some people are probably going to cringe going, oh, it's not original. But you know what? They're just a pain in the butt and they don't really do anything except it's for RF shielding. And that's purely it. They don't functionally do anything. So I don't feel bad removing them. Whoops. Okay. Well, when I was pulling this off, it kind of, kind of wrecked the ground here. So I'm actually going to put a little bodge wire from there to there, just to make sure that this ground is looped because this is actually used for the chips and stuff. And now there's a break in the ground plane. I'm going to fix that. Flipping the board over, we can right away see where rework has been done. These two chips have been changed. So both the CIAs and kind of lame, they didn't even put a socket in. They just they just left them. Oh yeah, this one has a 1989 date code and that one has an 882 date code. But why wouldn't they have put sockets in? That's a good question. Laziness, I don't know. And there's also obviously some type of, there's a bodge wire right here. This is uh, one of the logic chips. So that probably got replaced as well at some point. Over here, there's a lot of flux residue. So it looks like some rework has been done. I don't know if that was done at the factory. Someone's been in there as well. Let's try to get this can off. Usually what I do is I stick a pokey thing, I don't know what, pick or something in each corner. Lift. There we go, one of the early ceramic, ceramic Vic 2s, looks like it's an R5. And there are a couple sockets here, so whenever we rework was done, whenever they did it, this has 1982 day code, but they at least added sockets back in. Thank you, whoever you were. All right, let's fix this here. Okay, before we plug it into the monitor, I'm just going to plug it into the power supply, turn this on, and then see if the voltage rails are looking correct. So, it's on. 12 volts there, a little high. 4.74 volts. Seems a little low, doesn't it? 4.74, so, hmm. I don't know, nothing's burning hot, nothing smoked when I turned it on, so let's plug in the dead test cartridge and plug it into the monitor. Okay, like I said about the cable, before you, you test anything with the cable, make sure it's working on a known good system. So this is the VIC-20 adapter, and I have it hooked up to Chroma Luma, but only the Luma, so that's why it's black and white. But this, this cable is working, I have an image, so when I plug this into this board with the five pin connector, then I know that it's gonna work if the board works. All right, let's see if we even get a picture. Let's turn this on. All right, we're getting a black screen. Okay, we're getting a line here. So that means that the VIC is at least initializing, at least to some extent. So let's plug in this uh, diagnostic cartridge, see if that does anything. Let's plug this in. Got a red light on my cartridge. So if the cartridge has no red light, then the cartridge slot might be dirty or not working. So that's something to watch out for when you have a diagnostic cartridge. Sometimes I find these cartridge slots when they're old and you push the cartridge all the way in, you get nothing. All right, we're not getting anything here. So this definitely uh, is indicative of some kind of a problem. So I think the first thing I'm gonna do is let's pop off, well, at least the chips that are socketed and we'll put them in this zip board, see if those are working. I'm gonna use the chip remover. This thing is amazing. So with the VIC-2, it's sort of hard to get to. You just put this down onto the chip like this and you pull up and the chip comes right out. There's no fiddling around trying to pry it out with this metal can in the way. None of that stuff. All right, so that is the VIC. Here's the CPU. Boom, CPU out, just like that. And we got uh, one of the ROM chips is socketed, so we can pull that out. 
Okay. There's a ROM chip out. And we got the PLA and the SID, and those are both socketed as well. Oops. So just like that, I got those chips out. This thing is amazing. Okay, and with the Ziff, it's as easy as you just lift the little lever and then the Vic comes right out, for instance, and then I can just pop the new one in, close the lever down, and let's plug in the power. Video cable's connected. Well, okay, so it's working. It looks like garbage, but I have to say, I always find that these original R5s look terrible. And yes, it, it has the worst jail bars you can imagine, but we got the ready prompt, so we know that that, that chip works. So I'm gonna put a check mark on it, just so we know. That's tested, I'll put my original one back in. And turn it back on. And see, that's why the ZIF sockets are so great. Look at that, no jail bars. All right, next up is the PLA. And this PLA has a sticker over it, it says C64 Rev 3. 84 weeks, so this has been replaced already. So let's pop that in, put the lever down, power it on, and it's working. So PLA is good. Put a check mark on it. Check. So we got two good chips. Put my PLA back in. All right, let's plug in the SID. All right, there's the SID. It says 21st week of 1982. Now, the SID is not likely to cause the computer not to boot, but anything is possible. That's fine. And I don't have a speaker hooked up, so we can't test that right now. But I'm just going to... I'll put a check mark on it for now, just so we know. Pop the CPU out. This is my CPU, and we'll pop in the one from the other board. Okay. It's fine, working good. So CPU is check. So at the minimum, it has a working, well, I think a working, has a working PLA and then it has a working SID or it seems to work. All right, we'll put, put my CPU back in. And all we have left is this one ROM chip this is the 22501. I can't remember if that's basic or kernel or, or which that is, but we will pop mine out. I have to use the tool since this is not in a zip socket. Comes right out. I have, do have a rolled or a round hole socket there. So it's nice and easy. It makes good connections. Okay. That's fine as well. So I have found in the past bad chips, bad ROM chips can kill the whole computer. So that is a possibility, but it could be a million other things, right? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna repopulate these chips that we tested, but I'm gonna put some deoxit on the sockets first because Commodore used some really junky sockets, especially for the PLA right there and the SID. They used the crappy, crappy single wipe sockets. In fact. All of these are single wipe sockets, so they're all junky. But these two are extra junky, so yeah, that's crap. So U17, that is the PLA chip goes in there, so I'm gonna stick this back in. And the SID, we'll just leave the SID out for now, since that's absolutely not needed for this. And let's just give this another test like it is. Pull the die eye cart out just for fun. Big old zip. And interesting is when we do put the cartridge in, you know, we're not getting anything because even if it had bad RAM or something, we get some flashing. So something is either killing the bus or perhaps one of these logic chips is bad. So people always say that the MOS chips are really junky and cause all sorts of issues if you have Logic chips that are MOS brand. But actually none of these are. These are That's Motorola, Motorola, Texas Instruments. Uh, yep, there's a TI, and then this is Mitsubishi RAM, this gold RAM. 
And then, yep, this is a national semiconductor. So, so none of this stuff is actually MOS. The only thing are, are the ROMs and of course the Commodore chips. I think it's time to hook up the Logic Probe. So the Logic Probe has two clip leads on it. That's for power. You do need to power it up. So I'm gonna put one on the can right here for the RF shield around the VIC. And the other one, I'm just gonna use a little clip lead. I'm gonna clip these together so I can clip onto a leg of something. And remember how I said these resistors over here were on the five volts. So we're gonna hook on right there to the resistor. And that gives this thing the power it needs when I power this thing up. All right, actually, I'm gonna move this over here onto there. I'm gonna move that there. So yeah, there we go. So now just move these wires. So when we turn this on, you don't see anything happening on this, but if I touch something ground, we get a beep. And on here, there's a low light and a high light. So that's low because the RF shield is grounded. But if I touch where I'm getting power from over here, See, it's a different high frequency sound, and then this will be low frequency. So that's the ground, and that's the high ground. So that's how you can tell that something's going on with the high or low. And then when you touch a line that's transitioning, like it's got data on it, like it's going between high and low, there's a light on here that says mem, and that will flash, and this makes kind of a different intermediate tone. And that will tell us like that the data line is actually doing something. So one thing that I have to be careful of is the VIC chip, and I think the SID both have 12 volts pins going into them, and you do not want to hook this thing up to 12 volts. This is only designed for five, so just stay away from those two sockets. But any of these other logic chips, like the RAM and the ROMs, are absolutely fine to probe all the pins. So the computer's on right now, and if I test the, like this ROM, this is the kernel ROM here. Hi. So that's the beeping I talked about that it's saying that there's data on that pin. And it's higher frequency even yet. So there's data on that pin. And that one as well. So I'm looking for... I'm just going through all the pins here to see if anything has no signal or... Is So according to the logic probe, we seem to have data activity on all the address and data lines on the ROM, which is correct. That's what it should be doing, especially when you have the dead test cartridge in. Well, you see that the oscilloscope's on the bench and I did a lot of poking around with the logic probe and I did some looking with the oscilloscope and I actually don't really see anything wrong with this. So I'm gonna just shelve this for now and mark it up with the marker and just say black screen. And I'm gonna say uh, dead, no dead test. Just so I can remember that no, neither of those worked. And I did check off the check of the chips that are working, and I marked the board with a number one, so I know that this goes with that case. Let's move on to the second machine. Okay, machine number two. Haha, <laughs> it's missing a key. Hey, uh, actually, the video you're watching needs to end here. It's getting rather long. So come back for part two, where we continue the repair sessions. If you liked what you've seen so far, I'd appreciate a thumbs up on this video. Otherwise, you know what to do, thumbs down. Subscribe for more videos, and you know, part two will be coming very soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.